Before we get started, I have a quick favor. I've been self-funding the Finding Genius podcast for five years now. I've done over 3,000 episodes. And as you can see on YouTube, we're up over a million views on the channel, which is fantastic. The next thing I really want to push on is to get up to 10,000 subscribers. Because once we do, we'll be able to put a donate button and uh, we'll be able to solicit donations to help keep the podcast running and to also get the Finding Genius Foundation moving along. We have a big project studying anxiety, depression, and PTSD and working on a product to help people overcome these problems because I've seen them explode recently after the, the last two years of the whole virus situation. So if you would, please subscribe to the podcast. That would help us tremendously give us a thumbs up and check in the description for buy me a coffee it's about five bucks if you could buy me a coffee i'd really appreciate it. it would help keep the channel going and i love coffee thank you before we get started i have a quick favor i've been self-funding the finding genius podcast for five years now i've done over three thousand episodes and as you can see on youtube we're up over a million views on the channel which is fantastic the next thing I really want to push on is to get up to 10,000 subscribers. Because once we do, we'll be able to put a donate button and uh, we'll be able to solicit donations uh, to help keep the podcast running and to also get the Finding Genius Foundation moving along. We have a big project studying anxiety, depression, and PTSD and working on a product to help people overcome these problems uh, because I've seen them explode recently after the, uh, you know, the last two years of the whole virus situation. So if you would, please subscribe to the podcast. That would help us tremendously. Give us a thumbs up. And check in the description for Buy Me a Coffee. It's about five bucks. If you could buy me a coffee, I'd really appreciate it. It would help keep the channel going. And I love coffee. Thank you. Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1%. A real Jesus. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Before we continue, I've been personally funding the Finding Genius Podcast for four and a half years now which has led to 2,700-plus interviews of clinicians, researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000-plus downloads a month, we need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. Please visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click on Support Us. We have three levels of membership from 10 to $49 a month, including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar, and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click support us today. Now, back to the show. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast. I've got a really great guest today, Joel Salatin. He runs what's called Polyface Farms. He's, I mean, just been an integral force in the regenerative agriculture for, I'm not sure how many years, but... Uh, I've seen some of his books out there and uh, watched some of his videos, and he's a really, really, really knowledgeable speaker about uh, all food-related items. So, Joel, thank you for coming. Oh, thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. Delighted to be with you. Yeah, if you would, tell me a bit about your background. How did you get to where you are today, and, you know, what was it like before this? Yeah, well, yeah, it's hard, always hard to know where to start, but since we have such an unusual background, I'm going to start a little farther back than most with my grandfather, who was a charter subscriber to Rodale's Organic Gardening and Farming Magazine uh, when it first came out in, whatever, 1948, held, held this you know, big organic garden and all that. And so my dad got, you know, that kind of ecological, non-chemical bent from him, and I got it from dad. So, you know, I, I don't have a conversion story. I, I was born unorthodox in my DNA, I guess. And um, so after World War II, uh, dad... Dad went to Venezuela with Texas Oil Company as a bilingual accountant to make enough money to buy a farm in Venezuela, which he did after seven years. And um, then, and so then we started raising chickens and selling them there, and, and uh, we had this farm. But um, because our chickens were clean and the and the indigenous ones were were all had kind of a well, they had snot. They <laughs> had a nasal drip because of the unhygienic conditions they were all raised in, and the open sewer pots and all that stuff that uh, dad quickly cornered the market and everybody thought we were doing voodoo and witchcraft. 
So we got accused of that. And then the junta came in 1959 of Pettis and Menace. And basically the machine guns came in the front doors. We went out the back door and lost everything and came back to the U.S. So then we landed here in, uh, in Virginia, Shenandoah Valley on the most on the cheapest, most eroded gully rock pile that we could find and, and started over in 1961. So the first 10 years were devoted to, you know, experimentation. Dad, dad sought counsel from everyone. How do I make a living on this farm? And it was all, you know, buy fertilizer, plant corn, build silos, borrow more money, graze the woodlot, all of which he was opposed to. Uh, he was, you know, he was an accountant. So as an, as an accountant, he, he understood, you know, margins and, and, and that as a small farm, we had to wear the middleman hats by, you know, by branding and direct selling in, into the retail market. And so, and so, you know, at 10 years old, I got my first chickens and started selling them in the, you know, in the community to people at church, sold it, you know, had a couple restaurants, a couple schools. We joined a, a local kind of a, it was a precursor to today's farmer's markets, the, the curb market. So from, from 14 to 18, I was up every, you know, every Saturday morning of the year. It was a year round indoor market. And uh, by the time I joined at 14, there were only two elderly matrons and me. And those two grandmas took me under their wing. And uh, I'll tell you what, I wouldn't trade those four years of, 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 of their tutelage and, and that direct marketing, that retail experience for anything. Well, then when I went off to college, nobody else in the family wanted to do it. And so, you know, um, so we closed it down. By the time I came back from college, that market was done. The beauty of that market was it had been grandfathered in. So that if I joined 4-H and a woman joined the Home Extension Homemakers Club, we could sell anything without inspection. So we could sell butter and and uh, uh, a buttermilk and quiche and pot pies and beef. We could we could process beef in the backyard, sell it by the cut, grind it up. We could sell sausage and and, and pepperoni and uh, you know anything without any inspection. And so I I grew up with that kind of freedom. Uh, knowing what was potential, we were about 20 years ahead of our time. And so, you know, by the time I came back and the market was closed, that grandfathering was done. And now I'm thinking, all right, I want a farm. How do I, you know, how do I get here full time? And I realized I could milk 10 cows, sell the milk at just regular retail supermarket prices, make a good living on this little farm. There was only one problem. It was illegal and there was no exemption, no nothing, you know, that you could do to to try to circumvent that. And so, so, you know, I ended up going, working at the, at a, at a local newspaper for a couple of years, saved up a little nest egg, got married, built a apartment in the attic. We had a big garden. We lived on $300 a month, drove a $50 car and uh, <laughs> didn't, didn't have a TV, still don't have a TV. We didn't, you know, we didn't go anywhere, but we, we, we were able to save up a little nest egg to where I was able to leave outside employment, came back to the farm full-time September 24, 1982. And by that time, we had done a lot of experimentation with uh, compost, um, animal movement, uh, portable infrastructure, and different things to where we were actually feeling pretty comfortable that if we just, if we could get here full-time, we could actually, we could actually make a living. And so we did jump off that cliff. And uh, it, it, again, in, in uh, September 24, 1982, and um, that little nest egg uh, just just kept on holding and kept on holding. I thought we'd run through it in a year, but we didn't. It held on for a couple, three years, and we were able to build up a little a little reputation in the area, get some customers, develop a brand, and start a direct marketing. And here we are now in 2022, supporting 25 salaries some uh, 10,000 families, 40 or 50 restaurants, and it's become a, it's become a, a you know, a, a crazy thing, but. Um, wow. The, the, so the 40 beginning. years and yeah. your farm is still going and that supports right. a lot of people. Wow. That's right. It is. And right now there are four generations. Mom is still, still here. And uh, then there's us. And then our son, Daniel runs day-to-day -day operations. And then we have our three grandchildren here as well. So, uh, we're pretty excited to have four generations on the farm right now, and, and it's 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 good. So, you know, we we did a lot. Of the the rock piles, the gullies have have uh, the erosion has stopped. We've built soil on on rocks that were just bare rocks. We have soil now up over them that's grown up over them over the years. And uh, what used to you know what used to feed ten cows now feeds a hundred. The abundance and the ability to heal is beyond imagination. And um, you know, I'm not that old, but I've seen in my lifetime that degree of response 
to you know to uh, to correct management, and um, it gives me great optimism. Yeah, one thing I'm I'm sure you're probably much more aware of than I am, but uh, you know a lot of people are starting to talk about coming food shortages and global famine, which is crazy. If other farmers and other governments implemented your methods in the various countries, how much do you think we could mitigate the coming uh, coming starvation if it's real? Well, believe me, uh, nobody nobody's going to go hungry because there isn't enough resource. Uh, the only today, right now, almost half of human edible food on the planet is thrown away because it's either got a little blemish or a sell by date or spoiled or you know packaging got broken. Human civilization has never thrown away the level of food we do in the world today. So nobody in the world right now goes hungry because there's not enough food. They go hungry because of so geopolitical, social political issues. You know, a, a warlord won't let a Red Cross truck go, go across the you know the the road in Pakistan or Africa or, or, or whatever. And so so all of the hunger issues are not because there's not enough food. It's because there are you know there are there are glitches in the in the distribution program now that being said certainly there are places that are um are stressed you know desertification is increasing but through um through proper design and and permaculture principles uh we can absolutely mitigate if not eliminate those kinds of uh, dry conditions desert conditions we can hydrate places that you would never imagine could be hydrated and people people are doing it it is being done and and so trust me if anybody goes hungry it will not, it will not because the sun quit shining and the rain quit raining it'll be because of of you know socio political issue it'll be because of of some sort of um uh non resource related issue okay how big of a role is regulation and maybe over regulation playing in uh different communities being able to feed themselves properly Oh well, you just put your you just put your finger on probably one of the single biggest reasons for supply shortages, and and that is uh, regulation. So um, you know it's such a big topic; it's hard to know where to start. I'll I'll just I'll just um, throw out one idea um, that, of course, you know we've all now lived through 2020 and the whole COVID thing, and 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 the, the empty store shelves and the things that were going on there. And um, I would simply ask everybody, you know, do you think, do you think that, that the, we'll just say the U.S., forget the world, but just the U.S., if rather than having, you know, 150 to 300 mega 5,000 employee processing facilities for our food system, if instead we had had 150 to 250,000 community-based, you know, 20 to 50 per employee uh, processing facilities. This is, you know, slaughterhouses, canneries, you know, whatever. Do you think we would have weathered 2020 uh, far better? And I think all of us, I, I have not met a person yet that thinks that centralized, concentrated uh, food systems actually uh, serve people better. Um, almost everybody realizes, no, it'd be a lot better if we decentralized, democratized the access democratized the market and had a lot more, you know, small scale community or neighborhood uh, scale abattoirs, canneries, uh, food hubs and things like that. And so what what keeps this from happening is that the regulations, the, the food regulations, this is everything from slaughter to canning green beans to, you know, making hot pockets. Um, the all of the regulations are size prejudicial. In other words, they are much easier to comply if you're large scale than if you're small scale. And I have I I, I take great uh, philosophical umbrage with the very notion that you would have regulations that are size preju prejudicial. So so you know so somebody says, well, what's an example of one that's not size prejudicial? Well, a, a good example, I think, is the speed limit. It doesn't take any more effort to put your foot on the brake of an 18-wheeler than the foot than your foot on the on the brake or the gas pedal of a of a Prius, right? And, and so, you know, that's that's a, a non-prejudicial uh, regulation. And, uh, and and so so what happened? I mean, here's a great example. Let, let's say let's say that in order to have 
to comply with food regs on to make, say, let's say charcuterie. Uh, you have to have a th $2,000 thermometer that's a 24-7, you know, a double redundant thing. You know, $2,000 thermometer to verify temperature, you know, that's a, that's a spit in the ocean if you're making a tractor trailer load of charcuterie. But if you're making a five-gallon bucket full, that $2,000 thermometer just stopped your business. And so this is exactly, just take that over pretty much anything, any food item you can imagine, and, and that's what we have. Uh, we have these these onerous, tyrannical, capricious, and, uh, you know, I don't want to say malicious, but they seem that way sometimes, but, but certainly capricious and prejudicial regulations. The last time I testified before Congress, it was a, it was a hearing call, uh, called by uh, Congressman Dennis Kucinich when he was a congressman from Ohio, and it was after that, um, that undercover video uncovered that slaughterhouse in California that was you know, uh, spraying the cows with fire hoses and hitting them with forklifts to try to get them up so they'd walk into the, the knock box. And, um, and they convened this thing, and the question is, you know, what can we do about the meat system in, in the U.S.? And I was one of, I think, 12 who testified that day. Uh, they called me, and, um, and the first guy who took, you know, about two hours of the day was the, um, you know, the, the commissioner of the Food Safety Inspection Service, the federal, you know, federal top you know, uh, meat, meat inspector. And I was appalled at how he sat there and told those congressmen how efficient the FSIS had come because it had been able to push out of business thousands of community-based neighborhood small-scale slaughterhouses and now an inspector in, in the big industrial facilities, an inspector could see way more pounds of meat per hour than one in a small facility. And I'm sitting there thinking, wait a minute, I thought they were supposed to be inspecting for, for, for safety and quality. I didn't know that they were supposed to inspect. I didn't know that they had some sort of a, um, a, pound, a pounds per hour you know, uh, stipulation. I've never seen that in any of the regs. And yet, you know, I was, uh, you know, why should I be surprised that, in, that, that an outfit that is completely industrial based also has an industrial mindset about about throughput and flow through. I, I didn't know we were all we were competing that we had a, a NASCAR competition to compete on who could do more pounds faster. I thought what we wanted was clean, safe product, not how fast can you run it through. So you know the, the, the whole the whole um, food safety deal is a is is, is a crock, and it's important for us to appreciate that that um, that it's not. You know, it's not what it's cracked up to be. You know, you can you can go out and um, shoot a deer on a seventy degree day, drag it through the squirrel dung and the sticks and rocks, and and and, and promenade it through town on the front of your blazer in the afternoon sun. Take it yeah. home, bring it up in your backyard. Uh, you know, cut it out and feed it to your family and all of your friends, and you're a great patriotic American. But if you do, if you take an appropriate temperature day and do a cow, and and um, and sell a pound of uh, hamburger to your neighbor suddenly you know you're a you're a criminal and so this is this is obviously not about food safety it's about market access and so mm. if we actually if we actually opened up market access so that I'll just conclude by saying that that if if you and I as voluntary uh, as voluntary consenting adults could exercise freedom of choice for what to for the fuel for our microbiome right. without a, a bureaucrat being involved, we would have an explosion of small scale community neighborhood food alternatives and food systems that would that would ameliorate any kind of of food chain issues that we have. That that ultimately is the answer. The answer is not government involvement. The answer is government disinvolvement to allow the latent entrepreneurial community-based food system to flourish instead of instead of trying to choke it out of business, which is what which is what all the government regulations do. What kind of products are the most heavily regulated or overregulated? Like, you know, I know raw milk. I see it here now in Texas in some places, but I'd heard it was illegal in a lot of places. Um, you know, selling meat versus selling vegetables versus selling eggs. Which which areas are like the most regulated versus not so much? Yeah, 
Yeah, well, cer certainly the most regulated is dairy. There's no question about that. After dairy would come meat, you know, uh, beef and pork. And uh, then after meat and pork would come poultry. Poultry enjoys a couple of little, you know, small, small exemptions. And then, and then you have the whole value added thing where if you, you know, um, if you, for example, we can process 20,000 chickens a year uh, without being inspected. It's a wonderful, wonderful exemption. It ought to be extended to, to the same amount of, you know, butter and cheese and, and beef and pork and other things. This, this, this exemption has been in place since 1967. And, and I don't know, I don't know of anybody that's gotten hurt or, or, or sick or whatever from, you know, uh, uh, due to this, this exemption. Why? Because farmers that, that use this exemption, there's a numerical exemption. It's direct market. You can't sell to Walmart and Kroger's. So there's a direct, you know, a, a direct customer relationship. And, and you know, I, uh, so there's, a, you know, there, there are stipulations on it, but that make sure that it's small scale and direct market and, and transparent between, you know, producer and consumer. But where, where they really, where they really get you is uh is in the value added uh you know where you're you're making you know things like charcuterie you know hot dogs um uh sticks snack you know like meat snack sticks you know anything anything that's value added chicken broth you know pot pies uh, meat pies those, those you know pickles you know canned tomatoes um mm. any of that kind of value added material that's that really run run into problems so if I sell you a tomato versus sell you a can of tomato sauce, it's totally different in terms of regulation. Oh, completely. Yeah. Any, anyone can pull off on the side of the road anywhere in the U.S. and sell a, sell a tomato to anybody. No questions asked, no inspection whatsoever. But as soon as I take that tomato and I either slice it, put it on a sandwich, can it, freeze it, do anything besides an un, unsliced, I mean, I mean, this is the thing. Farmers markets, you know, uh, a lot of par problems that farmers markets farmers have that are that are selling like cantaloupes and, and succulent things like that. You know, mm -hmm. they can sell they can sell a cantaloupe, but they can't slice it and and uh, and offer um, offer you know slices to people to try. This isn't even a sale. This is just a sample. But the huh. but the the position of the health department in most cases is if you slice that, now that's a value added product. Which is which goes under manufacturing, and suddenly you know it, it's not actually food; it's a manufactured item. I mean, this is why, for example, for example, at our farm, we're an agri we're zoned agriculture here, and um, so you know we have a sawmill. We can mill logs into lumber for buildings and things like that. But if I take one of those boards that I've milled from my own tree and make it into a chair. It's illegal for me to sell that because that's manufacturing, and manufacturing is illegal in an agriculture zone. So Jeez, that's crazy. Yeah. Oh, it, it, of course it's crazy. Of course, no reasonable person could come up with any of this stuff. But you know, the, the bureaucracy is not reasonable, and certainly the, the 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 consumer advocacy people that are paranoid of of uh, somebody you know pulling a fast one on them, and they want a bureaucrat to protect them from any kind of poor business decisions. You know that's that's you know that's what drives this stuff, and uh, and at the end of the I mean, and those these folks get paid to sit in a cubicle and dream up dream up more more verbiage and more verbiage, and it just you know it just grows like a cancer every year. Crazy, yeah. I remember in New York, I don't know if it's still in place, but um, you know if, if bagel stores wanted to sell bagels, they couldn't slice them because if they did, it was a value add and they had to pay tax, and it was just yeah. ridiculous, you know. Yeah, so that's that's the kind of thing, and you know, you shake your head, but but as a, as a small business, think about. Look, a lot of customers want them sliced, right? Right. And, and so so one of the first items of business is meet the customer, right? You don't you don't sit there and and shake your fist in the customer's face. You say, hey, this is the way you want it. We'll we'll, we'll give it to you if you want. And, you know, if you want it sliced, if, if you want it cubed, <laughs> you know, how do you want it? We'll make it. We'll we'll be customer friendly here. But, you know, but, but the bureaucracy does not recognize that kind of, you know, the, well, Adam Smith, you know, called it the, the invisible, the, hand, the invisible hand of the marketplace to guide, you know, to guide both people in the transaction to get what they want, uh, the seller to get what they want and the buyer to get what they want. And so, so we're, you know, we're stuck. I'll tell you, 
uh, one of the most interesting or whatever uh, shocking things I guess I ever had. I was speaking at a at a college in California a few years yeah. back, and I asked. I had you know I had three hundred students in this uh, lecture hall, and I asked for a show of hands. I said, "How many of you?" We, we kind of got onto this topic, and and I asked, "How many of you think that it is that 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 you should be able that you you should have to have." a food safety inspector check out vegetables from your own garden before you can eat them. And yeah, a, third, a, a third of the hands went up. A third of the hands went up. Yeah. I, I was, I was speechless. I just did. I just looked, I, I just shook my head. I mean, that, that's, that's what we're up against. That's crazy. Well, I guess the, uh, the topic of regulation is pretty depressing and I, I do want to get some practical advice for people. So what's, um, you know, for someone that's never, I don't know, grown anything, done anything, but is concerned about, you know, better health and maybe more food security going forward. What are some things that they can do to help themselves? Oh, sure. It's, it's, a, wonder, it's a wonderful question. Yeah, and you're right. The, the regulatory discussion is, is depressing. However, there is a movement in the U.S. called the, the, Rogue, the Rogue Food Conference. Uh, we're doing two of them a year. And uh, they are, we're, we're showcasing all the people who have circumvented rather than complied to try to to try to uh, bring cleverness and, and genius, if you will, to, you know, to how do we circumvent this stuff instead of comply. You know, so it's, it's time to it's time to, to have a different tack. But what can an average person do to make sure that, you know, they've got their they've got their food and their their health up and running? Well, the first thing you have to do is you have to. You have to start being intentional and interested in, in, in your personal responsibility in this space. What we have right now is, is I think the average person thinks, well, I'll just eat whatever's convenient, whatever's cheap, whatever's convenient. And if something happens, I'm expecting the drug companies to fix me or the surgeon <clears throat> to fix me. And, and so the first thing that people have to do is understand my health is my responsibility. It's not the government's responsibility. In fact, it's not even the gover- the go- doctor's responsibility. It's my responsibility. So if I'm going to do that, well, first of all, let's stop doing the junk and let's stop doing better. So I'm not going to drink any stuff that's that's harmful like, you know, Coca-Cola. I'm not going to go to McDonald's. I'm not going to, you know, eat monosodium glutamate and high fructose corn syrup and 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 processed food and 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 you know cheerios and and uh you know fruit loops and that sort of mm-hmm. I mean, that, that stuff's like a it, it's a it's it's poison and mm-hmm. uh and so what we're going to do is we're going to stop the poison and then we're going to substitute good stuff that means we're going to uh buy from farmers who build soil instead of erode soil we're going to buy from farmers who are, are biologically oriented and not chemically oriented. We're going to buy stuff that actually, you know, decomposes. Uh, I mean, you take Velveeta cheese and squirt it on the table, you can walk away from it for a year, and it doesn't mold, it doesn't change, it doesn't do anything. You take real cheese, put it on your table, and in five days it's got three inches of mold, sprouts legs, and walks off the table. I mean, that's, <laughs> you know, that, that, that's what your body wants. Listen, if it won't decompose, it won't digest. And, and, and yet when we look at our food system, the whole the whole food industry is all predicated on extended shelf life. You know, how do we how do we make it shelf stable? How do we make it last forever? And we and, and we want to extend, extend, extend instead of instead of the fragility that comes with with uh, easy digestion. And so, uh, you know, when it comes to meat, we're looking for farms that have animals out on pasture not confined and we don't want any animals in confinement buildings and in, in factory farms um, mm-hmm. and 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 so we're looking for those pastured opportunities what you can do personally is you can do something yourself even if it sprouts some you know some alfalfa sprouts or mung beans on a in a quart jar on your windowsill you can have a, a vermicomposting kit under your uh, under your sink and grow and, and feed your chicken kitchen chicken scrap chicken kitchen scraps to uh, to worms and <laughs> take the castings and and take the castings and grow you know uh, you know uh, uh, feed feed that to a to a PVC hanging vertical herb garden uh, in a in a pocketed PVC hanger on your front porch you know and yeah. uh, some people put wind chimes you can you can hang these pocketed PVC gardens, the the uh, number of urban 
urban uh, food production things that are now available are are incredible. In fact, I just my last book was uh, Polyface Micro, where I I micro down everything that we do here. I have a whole chapter on how to have rabbits and chickens in a Manhattan apartment with no uh, without making any smells. And, and so so you can absolutely do this stuff, but it starts it starts by by getting by changing what's between your ears, getting your mindset intentional and interested about about what I'm going to do to change the thing. The, the, biggest, the biggest problem or the hurdle that people face is I want a different world, but I don't want to have to do anything to make it a different world. I want to keep doing what I'm, I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing. And I want everybody else to change. And so we, we tend to say, well, if those people over there would do that, and if this guy would do that, and if those congressmen would pass this, and if, you know, blah, 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 and we're always pointing out there. But the reality is that, that wherever we are in society is, is a physical manifestation of, of, what we've been, of what we've been doing and choosing for the last, whatever, several generations. We didn't get here overnight. We won't get out overnight. But we can, <laughs> we can start overnight. And and we can start feeding a different dog. We you know we can start uh, we can start creating a different path and a different direct trajectory, so that forty years from now our children look back and say, oh, you know, we 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 have a better world today because of decisions that mom and dad and grandma and grandpa made, you know, forty years ago. Wouldn't that be cool instead of being where we are and, and saying we got all these you know problems because you know people. Uh, didn't care if they if soil eroded. They didn't care if water was polluted. They didn't care if we, you know, uh, used the extra petroleum. They didn't care if the if the trees got all buggy and crooked and junky and all burned up uh, in, yeah. in forest fires. You know, at some point, it takes a different a different uh, mindset. So, you know, what do you think would be the absolute minimum that someone can do to improve their health and to kind of you know to start to connect with where food comes from. Like, for instance, um, you know, if they had, uh, they just had a little tray of microgreens and they ate them twice a day, they put it into their regular food, you know, would that make any difference, you think, in their health? Would that would that start to do anything for them to connect them to the food system? Yes, uh, absolutely it would. Uh, so, you know, I have a, I have a, a, a layman's uh, recipe kind of for, you know, for, for increasing your immunity for it for building up your immunity, which is, which is another way of saying building up your health. And uh, it, it starts by, you know, stop eating the junk next, start eating good stuff. And your microgreen idea is a, is a great idea, especially if you're not going to McDonald's anymore and, and, and get Coca-Cola, Dr. Pepper and all the Mountain Dew and all the high fructose corn syrup out, out of your house. Uh, so, you know, it, it's, it's, it's getting rid of the bad, instituting the good. Then the next thing is to, is to get out in the sun 20 minutes a day. You know, we, we don't, we don't get enough sun. You gotta, you gotta get out and, and the sun is a wonderful thing. And then, and then exercise. Uh, you know, I, I think you should, you should try to sweat 20 minutes a day, uh, work up a sweat. I don't care if it's running in place, doing yoga, uh, standing on your head, jogging around the block. Um, I mean, for me, it's, you know, it's running a chainsaw, digging a fence post hole, you know, carrying water buckets, uh, throwing firewood, you know, it, it, it's just regular farm work, uh, gardening, uh, worked up a sweat this morning, picking blueberries, you know, so, but work up a sweat, a few things, few things pull the toxins and the pathogens out of your body, like sweat. So, so embrace it, love it, you know, uh, uh, uh get with it. Then next thing is sleep eight hours a night. Um, you know, we don't, we don't sleep enough. We stay up late for the late show, and then we get up, and we depend on coffee to get us going. Um, you know, a, a little known fact about me is that, you know, I'm, I'm 65. I have never, I have never drunk one single cup of coffee in my life. Now, I'm not saying coffee is evil. I'm just saying that, you know, depending on caffeine to keep you up and going because you stayed up to 11 last night watching the late show uh, is, 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 has a long-term, you know, uh, uh, effect. And then drink water. We're, 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 we're all dehydrated. I mean, Americans are unbelievably just dehydrated. And partly it's because our uh, city water tastes so bad. So if you get a good, you know, water filter and start getting some decent water uh, that, that tastes good, that you enjoy drinking, you know, you ought to drink certainly more than half a gallon a day. 
every single day get get yep. rehydrated. There's a lot of evidence that that is a is a big deal. And then a, another huge one is is uh, humor, laughing. Um, you know, our problem is we, we we watch too much news and get frustrated and depressed and don't offset it with you know with with uh, comedy. And so I don't care whether you read a joke book or watch. Um, you know, watch funny stuff, but laugh uproariously, you know, uh, uh, 20 minutes a day. Um, uh, my, my thing is, you know, if, if you want to watch about an hour of news a week, that's probably about all you need. And then five hours of comedy, you know, till you laugh yourself silly. And it's okay if you're laugh if you're laughing by yourself, you know, it, that's fine. But, uh, but, but, but humor. And then, and then, you know, kind of my final, my final one uh, in this kind of recipe of immunity and health is um, is make a list of everybody that has done you wrong or that you dislike or you hate or whatever, and and forgive them. Uh, forgiveness uh, forgiveness is one of the most stress relieving things possible. When we've got when we've got this stuff, well, I'd like to get even with that person. Oh, I'd like to you know, and we we kind of carry this resentful, vengeful um, um, spirit in us because we've got this you know list of people that have uh, uh, crossed us. Um, there are few things that feed stress as much as that kind of thing. So just you know, just make a list and 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 get rid of it. Just get, it, it's gone. Get rid of it. Uh, you know, everybody's different, and they did me wrong. But you know, life goes on. It's okay, and I, I'm not dwelling on it. And and that's one of the best things you can do. So that's kind of <laughs> that's kind of my recipe for um, you know for health and immunity. And um, it's you know it's simple, but I think there's a lot of wisdom in it. Um, so people don't have to go it alone. What are are there typical types of organizations, or what what should people seek out so they also get some community along with doing their gardening and you know growing their own food, you know, at whatever level they choose. Where can yeah, they go to? You know, sure. Well, what a great what a great thing because you're exactly right. Uh, when you start when you start whatever walking to the beat of a different drummer. It gets pretty lonely very quickly, and of course, people start laughing at you. Oh, what are you become a food snob? You know, you got all this, all that stuff. So, you know, there's the Weston A. Price Foundation. There are numerous organizations, and you know, sustainable ag, uh, local food initiatives. You know, just the point is, you've got you've got to seek for this the way you seek for the right college for your kids, the right small engine mechanic for your lawnmower the right doctor for your surgery. You know, we, we, we don't have any problem investing hours, you know, sleuthing and vetting all those things. We just don't sleuth and vet our food. We go, we get whatever's cheap, whatever's easy. And, and, and I would suggest that our, our food provenance probably should be, you know, above all those others. And, um, and, and you gotta, you gotta put some attention on it, but yeah, there, there are communities, every, every state has, you know, sustainable ag or biological farming organizations. And in New England, it's uh, new England, organic, um, NOFA, new England, organic farmers association. There's, there's all sorts of, of things like that. There's again, the, the Weston A. Price foundation is probably the, you know, the best one for, you know, for traditional foods and, and, and healthy uh, eating. But there's homestead festivals. Good grief! There's there's homesteaders of America in 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 the Carolinas now. There's the um, farm where you live festivals. All of these are people that are embracing uh, self reliance, health, health without drugs, and, and and it's it's the tribe. You know, it, it's a tribe, and um, and you just have to you have to find that tribe. They're everywhere, and uh, they're all ready to ready to hold your hand, coach, help, and inspire you to, you know, to go past where you think you can go by yourself. Yeah, that's great. I think I had read that at one point you had tours of your farms, or is that is that not accurate? Or if, if people oh. want to eat farms, oh, yeah. and, you know, literally get a, you know, take a class or, again, get oh. involved, where, where can they well, go? Yes, a- absolutely, absolutely. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm always careful to do you know, self-promotion or shame, that kind of stuff. That's lest I be perceived as mercenary, but uh, for sure, um, you know, here at Polyface, we offer, you know, tours that are called, I'm, I'm the lunatic farmer, so they're the lunatic tours. Uh, we do seminars. We, we do gatherings. Uh, shoot, just last weekend, we had our, we had our, uh, our annual two days of truth with all sorts of unorthodox healing methodologies. 
and um, and and we, we did it last year. We plan to do it again next year. We have uh, uh, coming up. We have uh, God's Good Table in in a uh, three or four weeks, uh, where we'll have you know uh, talks about you know good food provenance, how to cook it, how to you know how to grow it, how to keep it, all those kinds of things. So um, you know we have these we have these gatherings coming on. Uh, there's going to be one you know Homesteaders of America is going to is going to meet here. So you know we have these farm gatherings right along through the season. Uh, with different topics, different things. So yeah, and 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 it is absolutely a tribe. I mean, they're di- obviously very different themes, some of them, but it's all it's all promoting. I would simply say, you know, the road the road less taken. Uh, you know, two roads converge in the woods. I took the less, the one less traveled by. It's it's all it's all that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's excellent. What are you seeing as happening with the uh, you know the food supply and the supply chains over the next? You know, let's say year. Do you have any more insight you feel than um, than other people because you're so you know ingrained in the food industry? Yeah. Well, so what what I'm seeing, I've never been so excited about about where we're headed. Let me just let me just say that what what COVID did was that it gummed up the works for for very large scale outfits. Now, I've already said that the regulations favor the large scale outfits. That's for sure. But what happened was the logistics, the logistics within these large outfits became much, much more difficult because when you have, you know, uh, 2,000 people, 2,000 people in damp concrete, no sunlight walls all day, you simply have an, uh, you know, an incubator for, for pathogens of all sorts, whether it's COVID or anything else. And, and so, uh, not only do you have the the threat of of um, of spread of vectors, but but you also then have the the threat of litigation, uh, human resources. I mean, these these folks they have now spent you know billions of dollars ramping up their human resource department to keep up with well you know Mac over in Zone Five he had COVID so who worked with him last week? All right, all you guys take off work for two weeks, and and not only do you do you lose that time. You know, paying for not for not working, but 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 you you, you gum up the works, and so um, my epiphany occurred. You know, about three months ago, when a lady walked in the farm store, we sell you know we sell beef, pork, chicken, all sorts of stuff here, and I heard this lady kind of gasp. She looked in the meat uh, case. And I said, "What's the matter?" And she said, "Well, I was just at Costco, and sirloin steaks there sixteen dollars a pound, and yours is nine dollars a pound." And the light, the lights went off, and I, you know, I've always been, you know, we've always been a little uh, more expensive than the regular uh, supermarket, and and you know, then I'm looking at Wall Street Journal, and I see that, you know, uh, Tyson's raised their beef prices 32 percent in the last 12 months. We've only raised ours 10 percent, and so so what's happening is the, the these massive big big outfits are starting to, you know, they've always said, well, we're more efficient, we're more efficient, we're more efficient. But but that efficiency is turning into fragility when you have rocky waters and rocky shoals, and and so our little speedboat can navigate better uh, through these disturbing times, and we can adjust a lot better. I tell you know, I don't wake up every morning wondering, oh man, I wonder who's going to sue us today because we didn't do the right COVID protocol. Or we didn't, you know, we didn't quarantine the right person for the right number of days. Who's going to call, uh, you know, the fair labor, the government, you know, bureaucracy and turn us in for violating some? I don't even think about that. But I can tell you, big businesses do. They 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 live on that edge and then that dread every single day. And it's simply grinding things, grinding things down, making it more expensive, more laborious, uh, more difficult to get anything done. So those of us who are who are small scale able to, to navigate this, we're we're able to to be nimble. You know, there's a business book out. It's not the it's not the big that eats the small. It's the it's the fast that eats the slow. And uh, and, and we know that that nimbleness in business is is um, certainly as important as efficiency. So now now efficiency in in the business world is being replaced by the word resilient, and people are realizing. You know, if if at first you're not resilient and you don't survive, then you don't have anything to be efficient about. And so right. resilience resilience is now 
you know, coming over. So, you know, here we've got, you know, Russia uh, not sending, you know, fertilizer, Ukraine not sending wheat. And we look at all this stuff and we just laugh because we don't buy any fertilizer. You know, we don't buy anything from Ukraine. We get it from local farmers here, GMO free. And we've got a, a tight, close supply chain. And, um, and and we don't depend on these things. We don't we don't buy any any fertilizer and fuel. You know we use we use uh, something like three hundred percent less per you know per dollar of sales than than the average farm. And so you know when when you when you put all those together, our resilience is just at this at this point in history and time, our resilience is extremely affirming. And and I'm hearing and seeing the same thing with farmers like us, you know, around the country. And we're all, you know, real excited about the changes that have, that have been made that are going to make people start to, you know, start to think about things, including their health. I mean, look, look, when things go down and you can't get to a doctor and you can't, you know, gas is expensive and, and, and the wheels fall off, you don't want to be sick. If there's one thing you don't want, you don't want to be sick in difficult times. And, yeah, and yeah. so th- this, this is driving a lot of, renewed interest in this okay how do i really make sure that i stay good and healthy during during these uh these days the whole the whole goal here is that you know if we all wanted to sit down and make a list of the things we're angry about frustrated about worried about those kinds of things it'd be a pretty big list today so the idea is to take that list and invert it and say yep that that's where things are going but i'm going <laughs> to invert that and use all that negative energy to develop creativity and innovation as antidotes to all that so that so that I can be a part of the of the group that offers hope and help when everybody else feels hopeless and helpless yeah that's amazing Joel so um for listeners that uh you know they they don't know where to start where do they start with you should they read your your books or should they (laughs) well I mean certainly they can uh jump on our website polyface farms uh, if you just Google in P-O-L-Y, it'll probably pop up Polyface Farms. The website has a lot of material. It has, you know, uh, I travel a lot and speak at presentations and things. You can see where I am. You can, you know, we, I've written 15 books. Uh, you can get them from us. You can get them from Amazon. You know, we have, we do seminars. We do farm tours. We do gatherings. We, you know, we're we're very active in, in this whole space. So, yeah, um, our our official you know reach out is um, is 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 the website polyfacefarms.com, and then you know we and, and then you know, I do a, I do a, a blog uh, called Musings of the Lunatic Farmer. I do a podcast with Dr. Sina McCullough called uh, Beyond, Beyond Labels, and so yeah, we we have a we have a footprint there that, that's out there, and we welcome all comers, and we're delighted that you're you know that you're interested in that. Excellent. Well, Joel, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. It's been great to talk to you. I appreciate it. I'm delighted and honored, and uh, thank you very much. Thanks for giving me another platform to share. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.